Eric. So next, Eric Orenstein will talk about the FathomNet GitHub Model Zoo. He's a postdoctoral fellow working in the Bio Inspiration Lab with Kakani. His research lives at the intersection of marine, machine learning, ocean imaging, and marine ecology. And he's been working on the FathomNet project, establishing benchmarks and designing metrics to improve database interpretability, facilitate access for non-ocean experts, and ease automated model development. Basically, how can we make this easier for everyone to use? Um, take it away, Eric. Can you unmute yourself? Eric, you should be able to. There we go. There you yeah. go. I was not a co host. Oh. Um, but I can scrim, share my screen now and do all that stuff. So I should have this up in just a second. Great. Okay. Can everyone see my presentation? Looking good. Great. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Katie. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it's really exciting to see everyone from all over the place tuning in and listening to us talk about FathomNet. Um, so like Katie said, I'm gonna be talking about the FathomNet model zoo. Um, you can access it again via our GitHub page. Um, All right, so again, you can access it via the GitHub page. Um, so Kevin already showed you this. It's accessible at github.com slash fathomnet. Um, like we said, there is community feedback. So if you have any issues, you can go there. Uh, Kevin just talked about the Python API, and I'm going to be talking right now about the model zoo. So first, uh, just some very high level, what is a model? What do we mean when we're talking about this? So broadly speaking, when people talk about machine learning, what they're trying to get is some mapping from an input to a desired output. Um, usually what we're talking about in the context of FathomNet is an image that we're trying to turn into a label, a localization, or both. Um, so Kakani used this example of a, a Gina earlier. Um, so say we have this image, we don't know what it is. We want to pump it through some magic black box of machine learning, and out the other end will pop our annotation. Um, or alternatively, a localization. So in this case, uh, you have the purple box around the Agena that says both where it is and what it is. Um, and fundamentally, this all relies on there being some reliable mapping between the input and the output, some pattern that we can exploit to learn something about what is in these images. Um, a lot of what people use to do this these days are the deep learning models that Kakani referenced before. And this, this allows us to have some advantages in terms of how we can share these. Um, so a big reason why we want people to share is that open sourcing helps others use your models and learn from your models as they work on uh, their own data. And hopefully they will then feed that data back into something that you can use. Um, and specifically with deep learning, it allows us to do something called uh, fine tuning. So what fine tuning allows you to do is exploit a model that someone else has trained for some source data and borrow some of the layers to help speed up your own training procedure. So in this uh, very um, high level diagram, say you have a source data set that you've trained to output a certain uh, set of classes and you want to adapt it for something else. So you can grab the lower layers that were pre-trained and copy those over to a new model change some of the output layers at the very top and run some training again in a fine tuning procedure that will then allow the network to operate on your new data set. Um, you end up with a target model um, from the output. So what this allows you to do is train a bit more quickly and with less data. Um, of course, there are caveats to this. I'm not going to get into too many of the details there. Um, but fine tuning is sort of the, the stock standard procedure these days for people that are not operating with gigantic amounts of data and that don't have a lot of in-house expertise. Um, so this brings us back to our uh, GitHub page. So imagine that you uh, want to go and look through some of the models that are already there. Um, you click through to that FathomNet model page, and it will take you to essentially a readme. Um, it goes through a bunch of information here um, that uh, includes a lot of 
stuff about our use policy. So there's some addendums to the use policy here in addition to some of the stuff that Connie mentioned in her presentation. Um, but if you scroll down the page a little bit, you end up at a table here uh, that describes some of the object detection models that we've already made available. Um, so there are a couple of columns here uh, that tell you a little bit about what the model name is, um, the type of model class that was used to train it. So in this case, uh, a YOLO v5 model, the habitat that it was tuned for, uh, this one is for a benthic environment, and then a brief description of what is in the data, or sorry, what is in the model and what the model is used for. And importantly, we also have associated a digital object identifier reference number with the model. And we use a service called Zenodo, and, and we recommend that lots of other people look there as well. So what is Zenodo? Uh, Zenodo is an open access repository that's made by the maintained by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN. Um, they put this system together, I think initially, to share data that was being generated by the Large Hadron Collider. Um, so that entails petabytes worth of data that need to be shared broadly across international borders. And they've open sourced this and given access to people who want to submit data sets that are up to 50 gigabit, gigabytes in size. Um, and it is, again, publicly available. It is a service that they're providing for the world. Um, it is open source at its best. Uh, if you start using lots of their resources, um, there are mechanisms for including funding for them as a line item in your budget. So it's worth looking into if you start using the service a lot. Um, but in the meantime, it's pretty easy to sign up and share things that are relatively small, like the models that we're talking about. Um, part of why we suggest using Zenodo over other resources for this is that they have very, very good data safeguards. Um, it is something that is an important project that is central to CERN. Uh, it's going to be there for a long time, and they have lots of good tools for, for ensuring that what you put up there will be there for uh, time immemorial. Um, it's easy to sign up. You can sign up with an email address. You can connect it to your Git profile or your uh, ORCID ID, um, whatever is most convenient for you. So it's a very easy interface. Once you have an account, uh, you open up a new repository that you want to upload. And then there's a drag and drop interface that many of us might be familiar with from something like um, uh, Google Drive or any other cloud resource that you use. Um, so these are some screenshots that I took when we were uploading one of the models that we've put up on Zenodo and linked to our FathomNet GitHub page. Um, so there are a couple of critical pieces, a few key components that we add into the repository uh, that, that we recommend everyone else does too. The first is um, some uh, set of model weights. So again, if you're using a neural network, uh, you can share the weights and that allows people to interact with it and use it very effectively. Uh, this particular format is specific to PyTorch. Uh, any other format is fine. Uh, just make sure that that, that that information is up there. Um, we also want to make sure that people can reproduce those results either in training or in validation. Uh, so we request that people include these, um, in this case, JSON documents that list out all of the images um, that were used to train or validate the system. Um, this can be in all sorts of different formats, but uh, the ones that you would be able to download from this particular model would point you towards uh, UUIDs that would allow you to directly access the images from the FathomNet database, either using the API tools or via the front end. Um, we also would request that people include some a uh, snapshot of how well their algorithm worked. In this case, what you're looking at is a confusion matrix for the Ambari benthic uh, object detector. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with looking at a confusion matrix, along the bottom is the true label. So what we know the uh, objects are supposed to be. And on the y-axis is the predicted label. So what the algorithm puts out. Um, if this were a absolutely perfect classifier, all you would see is a dark blue diagonal line going through this matrix. Um, but what it allows you to do is quickly look at your detector and see how well it works. Um, so by providing this information, users can come and look at it, see what sort of performance they can expect. Um, and then they can also download everything and reproduce those results as they like. Um, there are a bunch of other fields that need to be filled out in order to submit something to Zenodo, including a title, 
the authors, in this case, uh, Ben, uh, who in his org ID is right there. There was also a short description um, akin to what ends up in the FathomNet model zoo, uh, including a high level description of what it was trained to do and a little bit about what each of the um, uh, pieces of information are that have been submitted. Um, including in this case, above and beyond what we talked about earlier, uh, there is a label map that allows you to uh, um, put some of the species designations together into super categories, uh, and also a Python notebook that illustrates how to load all of the weights into a particular machine learning framework and execute them on new images. Um, those okay. are Sorry, about four minutes, Eric. Okay, thanks, Katie. Um, so those those items are are uh, additional, uh, not necessary, um, but are very helpful for people that might be trying to use your models. Um, the other thing that Zenodo will require you to do is designate uh, access rights, um, either open access, embargoed, or restricted. Um, we obviously would recommend going for open access, uh, but if you need to, uh, you can set things as either embargoed or restricted and then update them in subsequent versions. Uh, you'll also need to select a license here. Uh, in this case, we did uh, Creative Commons 4. Uh, there are lots of other options here. Uh, it's well worth familiarizing yourself with what these different licenses imply and making sure you select the, the right one that's appropriate for your work. Um, this is not a fully necessary, uh, or sorry, um, this is not one of Zenodo's required boxes, but we would suggest that you specify that you want your submission to be connected to the FathomNet user community. We have one registered on Zenodo. So by filling that out, it will notify us and we will be able to connect your um, submission to our resources uh, quickly and rather easily. Um, so once you have all your files staged, you can go ahead and click a button and it will upload it and automatically generate a digital object identifier for your model. Um, quick word of caution, once uploaded, you will not be able to remove the files from Zenodo, but you are able to version them. So if you need to update them, you can do so uh, through that. Um, and then we'll be updated via the community uh, uh, feature uh, once you click go, and then we will be able to connect uh, automatically once we get notification of that. Um, so finally, you then take this and you put it back into the FathomNet GitHub model page, uh, where others will be able to click through to that DOI and grab all the resources that you've provided. Um, so uh, if you want to uh, edit this readme, the way to do that is by clicking on the little button at the top there. Um, this is all in GitHub, and it will open up an editor for you. Uh, that will allow you to put in your description into the table. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with Markdown, uh, there is a handy link at the bottom of the page there that will show you how the, um, uh, that works and give you some of the syntax. Um, once you do that, you'll open up a new commit and propose the changes. Uh, we specify that you do this um, by committing and starting a pull request, and that will again notify us through GitHub that your um, uh, addition has been staged, and we will then merge the change, and it will be added to the table. Um, so with that, I will stop. Thank you for listening. Take some questions if we have time, and I'm happy to talk more about this during the various breakouts tomorrow. Thanks very much. Thanks, Eric. We do have about one minute, so maybe one or two quick questions. All right. We'll move. All right. There's, we got one from Sean. Curious if localizations or bounding boxes should be a specific shape or have certain dimension ratios. Do the shapes affect the efficiency in the training of the algorithms? Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, right now, there, I mean, there's no specific dimension that you need. Most of the stuff that I was talking about registers rectangular bounding boxes. Um, I don't know that the different shapes affect efficiency per se, but it's a different target. So you'd have to be using a different network to, to, make, that, um, to make that work. Um, there are lots of examples of that. Um, we don't 
provide those annotations at the moment in FathomNet, but like Brian said earlier, if there's a need for that sort of um, annotation style, uh, then, then we can talk about implementing that. Great, thanks, Eric. And feel free to keep adding questions to the chat. And now we'll go back to Kakani to tell you about the FathomNet community.